right now I want to talk about uh, the, um, uh, an issue of constitutional design that I've personally been developing in connection with the Free Nation Foundation. Uh, I can't promise that anyone else in the Free Nation Foundation assigns on to precisely this vision. Uh, but my idea is this. How would you go about designing a constitution for a new libertarian nation? Now, as libertarians, the first thing we think of is, well, we want a nice long bill of rights. And we want to make it very detailed and no ambiguities, and we want to describe in detail exactly what the rights are. And yes, I think a constitution should have that. But what we have to recognize is that a bill of rights isn't enough. Just by itself, it's a wish list. Uh, you know, the old Soviet constitution had a bill of rights, not an ideally libertarian one, but still not too bad a one, but the rights were more or less ignored in practice. So it's not enough just to have an, a list of the government's promises to be nice. What you need is some kind of political structure to ensure that the government will actually behave in the manner that the Bill of Rights says they ought to. So you need some kind of constitutional limits on power, and the stuff that Randy was talking about earlier is uh, uh, along the lines of what we're talking about. But you might say, well, uh, since Randy's already uh, suggested ways in which having a government that is a central monopoly of power uh, is part of the problem, and since they've already come out of the closet as an anarchist, you might say, why am I talking about designing a constitution for a libertarian country at all? And doesn't that sound like one of the status projects from my old bad days uh, when you know, I just wanted 1% of government instead of zero? Well, uh, the reason, there are a couple of reasons for it. One is, if you're starting up a new libertarian country, in some sense you've at least got to have something that looks like a government in order to interact with other governments. If what, you, if what you've got is a territory that other governments see as just empty and unclaimed, uh, it's going to be very easy for other governments to claim the right to go in there and restore order. Uh, and in world opinion, they'll be able to get away with it, because world opinion basically agrees with them that if there's no government there, then there isn't any order there. And, you know, eventually we would hope to persuade them otherwise. But, you know, just starting off, you've got to, um, uh, you've got to initially give the impression that you've got, a, uh, got something that other governments will respect, or that you can use public opinion and world opinion to get them to respect. Also, if you consider the fact that perhaps suppose you are taking out a lease on some land uh, the way uh, the British government did with Hong Kong. Well, there's got to be an owner, a holder of the lease. There's got to be some organization that is the leaseholder for that land. And so there's got to be, in some sense, that's a monopoly already. So that's one, uh, one issue is that we um, you might have to have something at least sort of governmental in order to be able to interface with other nations. And that's part of what this, um, this international relations uh, uh, conferences that we're, uh, we're doing in October is to talk about how a government of a free nation would interact with other governments. Um, you know, in a previous uh, conference, we've talked about the, you know, the, the really creepy issue of national defense, but this is more sort of the ordinary day-to-day -day stuff about you know, when, the, um, you know, when they come to deliver mail, who's authorized to pick it up, that kind of thing, uh, international mail. Uh, not as sexy an issue as national defense, but uh, something that would matter in day-to-day -day, uh, existence. Uh, another reason for not just going for a purely anarchist system is if we're trying to build a free nation movement, uh, we need to get the cooperation of the libertarian community as a whole, and it would be a bad idea to limit it to just the anarchists or just the minarchists. We need the cooperation of everyone. And so... Uh, I think that there'd be good reason to try and come up with a system that in some sense combines aspects of minarchy, that is limited government or minimal government, with aspects of uh, anarchy or polycentric order. You need to combine both, both in order to be able to present a governmental face to the outside world and in order to get uh, cooperation from libertarians because uh, anarchist libertarians will be perhaps reluctant to uh, get involved in a project of, of a purely uh, minarchist approach to libertarianism because they're afraid it won't work. They're afraid that if you've got the centralized monopoly of power, pretty soon it'll be acting like Leviathan all over again. 
On the other hand, minarchists may be reluctant to get too involved in trying to build a, an anarchist country because they think that won't work. They think it'll break down into warfare among competing protection agencies. So we should have something that in some sense can be something that both sides can get behind even if neither side is completely happy with it. Uh, so how would you combine aspects of of minimal government and aspects of anarchy into a single system. Well, there are two ways of doing it, not necessarily incompatible ways. I think ideally you should try and do both. One way is simply to divide the territory, to have part of the territory be anarchist and part of the territory be minarchist. And in order to have the, um, the minarchist part be the part that faces outward to other governments and looks like a government, you sense you could have it like a donut ring. Uh, you know, the, the ring on the outside would be the minarchist, and then there'd be sort of a, a little area in the middle uh, that would be anarchist. And this would allow a kind of competition between the two systems. It would allow us to test how they work in practice. And each one could, in principle, serve as a check on the other. I mean, if the, if the minarchists are worried that the anarchist thing is going to collapse into chaos, well, they've got the minarchists there to restore order if need be. On the other hand, if the, uh, if the anarchists are worried that the minarchist thing is going to become a swollen leviathan, well, you've got the anarchists in the middle who can uh, go out and put a stop to it if they're hired to do so by the oppressed victims of the minarchist regime. Uh, so uh, that's one uh, solution. Uh, the other solution uh, is a is somewhat more complicated, and this is primarily what I want to talk about. Uh, and this is something I call a virtual Canton constitution. And uh, in fact, I've written a, uh, a fairly lengthy version of this constitution, which is sort of a work in, in progress. Uh, it's a, th that is on the website already. So if anyone wants to look it up and give me comments on it, I'd be very grateful for it. Because uh, it's the fifth version, or sixth version, I forget which, so far. And it's you know, people are constantly pointing out some way I've screwed up, and so I go and fix it. and onward I go. Uh, and um, really this constitution, you know, it, it's not sort of, it's not okay, I knocked something over. <laughs> well, I, that doesn't change the past. It was knocked over. Nothing can change that now. Basically, I've humiliated myself in front of this entire group. I might as well go home. But I'm used to humiliating myself. Just wait till talent night. Anyway, <laughs> so um, uh, anyway, what I mean about this this constitution, I'm not actually proposing this constitution as in you know let's all sign this constitution and go off and start something up. Although you know I wouldn't kick if you did that. But uh, it's just sort of to put out ideas on how a constitution should be organized. And uh, the main the main idea of this what I call a virtual Canton constitution, is it has two levels. It has a, uh, a central or federal government, you can call it that. Uh, and then it's got various local governments, you can call them that. Uh, however, there is what Randy calls the competition principle at the local level, not at the central level. The central level is just one evil leviathan for the whole thing. Uh, that's the, the compromise I've made. But uh, the, uh, the central government is very limited in its powers and the, uh, I mean, e really, really limited in the sense that, you know, it's limited in even the libertarian things it can do. The purpose of it is to push as much decision making down to the local level as possible. And what the local level is, is, you know, I was inspired to some extent by, um, you know, by what a lot of libertarian, federalist, decentralist thinkers have said about the idea of having little local cantons with a lot of autonomous control. But then I thought, why do they have to be territorial? Why couldn't you just change canton membership without getting up and physically moving? Uh, so you could, um, uh, you know, if you're a member of canton A, uh, that means that you and a whole bunch of other people have sort of signed on to A, and you have certain local, uh, that is, certain laws that you're governed by. But if you don't like the way Canton A is working, then you can simply switch to Canton B. And this will determine both your switching your representative in the, in the national legislature, if there's one, also switching what local uh, laws you're, uh, you're under. It might, that might come as a package, or it might not. It would depend. Um, and the idea there would simply be that 
uh, you would have free competition, freedom of, of entry and exit among these various different cantons. And uh, as far as possible, the idea would be that there's disputes among the cantons, and disputes about, well, you're my neighbor, but you're under Canton A and I'm under Canton B, and how do we resolve this? Uh, appealing to the central government to resolve it should be a last resort. It will be there as a kind of backup to keep the minarchists happy. Um, but every attempt would be made to try and make it so that appeals didn't go there, but instead would, would work, go to independent arbitrators and that kind of thing. And uh, so basically, if you take the United States as an example, it would be as if you had the federal government still there, although really stripped down. And then you had the various states, but you could, you know, you could be living in what's geographically North Carolina, but be a citizen of Alaska um, if you wanted and be, live under Alaska laws. And if you didn't like them, then you could switch to uh, Florida or whatever. And in a way, what the system is rather like is something that a lot of you may know if you're uh, familiar with uh, David Friedman's book, The Machinery of Freedom, is the old Icelandic constitution, where there was in some sense a legal system for the whole country, but uh, you could pick your individual assembly, and there was a general assembly, the all thing for the whole country, but then there were these individual uh, assemblies with individual chieftains, and you could, in any given area, you could sign up with one chieftain or another without actually having to move. Uh, and so you, the chieftain was your representative at the National Assembly. Um, so I was partly inspired by that. Um, well, uh, why don't I break with tradition and actually stop so we can get uh, uh, discussion going here and we can have time for uh, more than one question. So.